Ready? Good morning, everybody. It's great to have you all in the house of the Lord with us this morning. If everybody wants to stand, we're going to start worshiping our great and awesome God and ask him to open up the heavens. for this day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth For those of us who are visiting with us, there are blue connection cards in the pews in front of you. You can fill those out and drop those in the offering plate as it comes around. And then also, if you have any prayer requests, there are pink slips in the pews in front of you. You can fill them out and drop them in the offering plate, and one of our elders will pray for those later on in the service. And now we're going to take this time to greet one another in the Lord.
Hello, church. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on this uh, glorious day that God's given us to praise and worship His name. We'll continue our worship now by giving our tithes and our offerings, our sacrifices, a giving uh, to the Lord. Let's take a few moments to uh, pause and give thanks for all the blessings that we have. Lord, we are a blessed people, very blessed, and we're grateful for the power of your presence with us this morning. God, we've uh, sung today about show us your glory, and we can't help but see your glory today as we look at the beauty outside, the spring flowers popping out of the ground, the beautiful faces in this church this morning, the power of joint fellowship and worship and sharing together. God, all of those things are revelations of your glory, and for that, God, we're grateful And so, Lord, with grateful hearts, we give to you our offerings now, and Lord, we pray you continue to use this church to spread the good news of Jesus Christ through these offerings that we dedicate to your service now. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of announcements before we continue in our worship. First, there is going to be a scavenger hunt here at church. You see flyers uh, throughout the church that have been posted around The scavenger hunt will be Saturday, May the 11th from 10 till 1230. Uh, Every adult is welcome and lunch will be provided. You'll meet here at St. Peter's, find out the rules and get to meet up with your teammates and then head off on this scavenger hunt. So it should be a fun day for everybody who can uh, be part of that and participate in that exciting time. Our day of prayer is coming up. We have been doing this uh, for years now on the Saturday before Easter where we gather here in the sanctuary for an eight-hour time frame to pray. And it's a time for us to consider Christ's great sacrifice when he was on the cross. It's a time of mourning and repentance. It's a time of brokenness. It's a time to come and and pray uh, for ourselves, to pray for our church, pray for our community and pray for those who need to know our Lord Jesus. So please come out, spend some time during the 8 to 4. If you can be here for five minutes, that's great. If you can be here for an hour or two, that's great too. Whatever time you can come and be here in the sanctuary, the church will be open all day. And speaking of Holy Week, we have several things planned for the season of the Holy Week. We will have Palm Sunday service here next Sunday where we'll celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We'll be waving the palms and celebrating his, the recognition of him as the king. Then on Monday, Thursday, we'll travel over to Cador's Church of the Brethren. It's about three miles from here on Route 214. If you need directions, please see me. The praise team from Cador's Church will be leading the worship part. And then Ben Godfrey, the associate pastor there, and I will be leading devotions throughout the evening. And we're going to follow Christ uh, through some significant times in his life. And there'll be devotions throughout the evening surrounded by worship for us to consider and contemplate what Christ had in mind to do in going to the cross. Also next Sunday, we will have a uh, special time during our mocha bar. And there's an announcement about that in your bulletin Uh, Justin Castile from the YMCA has reached out to us and has asked if our church would be willing to host a diabetes program. And so next Sunday, he will be here during our mocha time just to talk to folks informally about those who may think you have uh, diabetes, who may be pre-diabetic, or maybe you're working with type 2 diabetes. There's a a program that the YMCA puts out that uh, we're thinking about hosting here, so we're trying to gauge how much interest there might be in having that type of seminar uh, here. So if you're interested, check out Justin. He's going to have a booth set up downstairs in the fellowship hall during our MOCA time next week. And then last thing for our ministry minutes today, just wanted to talk uh, to our church about Wednesday evening, May the 1st. For those of you that don't know, we have a children's program every Wednesday evening here from 6.30 to 8 p.m. called Awana, Approved Workmen's Are Not Ashamed of the Gospel. And so each week our children learn the scriptures here. Our leaders and volunteers come together every Wednesday night and celebrate with the children the truth of God's scripture. 
And so the children have been working very hard all year long, and we want to recognize their hard work. So on Wednesday evening, May the 1st, we're going to have a carnival here. We're going to have hamburgs and hot dogs and french fries and snowballs and all kinds of carnival-type food. And then there'll be games set out here on the lawn, a bounce house and all kinds of other things to create the carnival atmosphere. So we will be celebrating the kids, and then at the climax of the evening, there'll be some final presentations for awards and things that the children have earned through that time. So we want to encourage you, if you have young children, grandparents, you're welcome to come along. If you have friends, family, neighbors, coworkers with young children who aren't involved in the program, this would be a good time for them to come and have fun with our kids and learn just a little bit about what the program and the ministry is like. It would be a great opportunity for us to, to get exposure beyond our traditional families that have been involved in the program. So think about coming out that night. Jerry is also in the process of working with all the small group leaders. We're hoping that each small group would take a station at the carnival. We're going to have a ring toss and all kinds of games, and so we need people to run those games. And Jerry's hope and goal is that each small group will take a game and just run that for the evening. So as the kids come up, you'll just be ministering to the children and helping with the game and then prizes and things like that uh, to give out as part of it. So we're hoping that's a way that our whole church can get involved and support these kids and celebrate the hard work that they've done uh, throughout the year. All right, let's everybody stand now, and we'll continue with uh, the singing part of our worship this morning. This morning, I'll be reading from uh, the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 145, verses 3 through 5. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Now let us sing about our wonderful God. And overwhelmed at how your mercy fell and changed the heart as hard as mine. I tried to turn away, deny the hand you gave, but you refused to leave my side. Wonderful God, wonderful. again to stand before you now and sing wonderful God wonderful God wonderful Savior wonderful love who could compare none can be found wonderful Savior You said you never leave me, and you never did. You say I have a future, and there's a life for me to live. Lord, I want to praise you and say, wonderful God, wonderful God. 
a wonderful God and a wonderful Savior. And it's because of his amazing grace that we sing to him today. down from heaven and saw us as sinful beings that needed a savior. God, thank you for the promise that began all the way back in the book of Genesis of one who would come, who would crush the head of the serpent and provide great grace to sinners, to sinners that began with Adam and Eve, but has continued for every generation and continues even to us. God, all of us are in need of that great grace. Your word promises that it is by faith we are saved through grace. 
And so, God, thank you for that rich, powerful, beautiful grace, that grace that was shown how wonderful your love is for us when Christ went to the cross for us. we consider the great and wonderful cross we're humbled by it for sure we're thankful for it we're grateful for the blood that Jesus shed that we find forgiveness of our sins through it and so Lord we take just a a quiet moment now to take this time to confess individually personally our own sins before you Psalm 32, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. God, we like King David are thankful for the forgiveness of sins that you do not count our transgressions against us, but you have taken them far from us. 
So Lord, we praise you today and we'll praise you forever for that great grace over us. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Everybody can go with uh, Miss Gwen for all the children. <clears throat> She's waiting back there for you to take you to Children's Church. For the adults that are staying, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We will continue this morning in our series as we're working through the book of 1 Corinthians. And if you look down in your bulletin, you know it says uh, Pastor Jerry is supposed to be speaking this morning. I'm obviously not Pastor Jerry. <clears throat> Got a call this morning that the uh, stomach bug has hit Jerry, and he was uh, so weak he couldn't even stand up this morning. So let's uh, pray for him and pray that Karen does not get sick. So I've had uh, four hours uh, of preparation to get ready for this, so hopefully uh, with Jerry's notes and the presence of the Holy Spirit here, it'll uh, speak some things to your hearts this morning. As I mentioned, we've been working through this book of 1 Corinthians, and we've titled the series, Stop the Madness, because Corinth was a place that was crazy maddening, much like our culture today. The church had worship wars, they had leadership wars, they had immorality problems going on, and as we'll learn today, they had massive conflict going on in the church, even to the point where they wanted to sue one another. Today, we get to hear a little bit from the Apostle Paul, who is writing in a sarcastic tone of voice. Now, when we think of Paul, we think of him as a great writer, as a great orator, and he was all of those things for sure. It was rare for him in his writing style to use sarcasm, much like it's rare for me to use humor in fact, I find when I try and joke with people, it totally goes over their head. <clears throat> At Christmas time, we were looking for some music that we were going to do, and so I took the responsibility to go find the sheet music for the band, and I found this uh, wonderful tune that was to be accompanied by a banjo. And so I sent it to Chris and Tila and said, what do you think? Is there enough time for Chris to learn the banjo by Christmas? <laughs> It went days, and I got no response from the email. Not that I have anything against the banjo, just none of us play, and it totally went over their heads, and we joked about that later, like, I can't tell a joke, I can't deliver it. <clears throat> so in that light, it's unlike the Apostle Paul to use sarcasm, and when you read this text today, you may sort of, on the surface, be like, where is he going with this? But he's using sarcasm as a literary device to emphasize his point. How many of you have ever gone to your auto mechanic with a problem where you're driving down the road and you can hear, you know your car, right? You've been driving it for 50,000 or 100,000 or 200,000 miles, whatever. You know your car. You know what it normally sounds like. And then inevitably it comes up with this weird sound. So you, get, you drop your vehicle off and you meet the mechanic and you're trying to describe to him or her what is going on with your vehicle. And so you may say, say to the mechanic something like, it makes this noise when I'm driving down the road. Pa-ding, 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 pa-ding. Now, some of you would just turn up the radio louder to ignore that sound. <laughs> Suggestion, that might work for a little while, but eventually there's going to come a point where you do need to see your mechanic. So, I'll come back to that illustration at the end of this morning. I won't go there now. I won't try and be funny again. Let's just get to our text, all right? When all else fails, let's open our Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you desire to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people. 
Paul uses very abrupt or direct language here to address the Corinthians. He's challenging them because they have disputes, they have disagreements. And they're going to the secular courts to address disagreements between brothers and sisters within the church. Now, Paul is getting to the point here where the public courts are described as the unjust. You know, bribes, things can be given to the judge to sway their decision or maybe to the jury that you can say things or do things to twist the truth to get the outcome to be what you want. And Paul says, why would you choose the courts over the saints? Why would you skip over God's people and fail to give them the opportunity to mediate the disagreement? Remember, Corinth was a very culturally diverse area. They were very educated. They were very intellectual beings. Fast forward to today. Would you decide to take a matter before our courts? These are the same courts who have taken prayer out of our schools. These are the same courts who have removed the Ten Commandments from public assembly places. These are the same courts that allow women and men to use the same restroom, depending upon which gender you identify yourself as. These are the same courts that have decided that abortion is okay, even up to the time when the baby's heading down the birth canal. Yeah, doesn't that put it in the right perspective? That's what Paul is getting at here. The courts are not where Christians should have our disputes resolved. Verse 2, do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Paul, again, sarcastically is challenging the church here, asking them, are you unworthy God has told us in his scripture that we have been deemed worthy because we have the blood of Jesus Christ over us. We've been saved by grace through faith. And he tells us repeatedly in the scriptures that we one day will judge the world. Did you know that? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one day you are going to sit on thrones that God has given for you and you are going to judge this world. And so Paul is sort of taking them out to the woodshed here, saying, you've been deemed worthy by God. He's one day going to grant you the privilege to judge the world. How is it then that you can't deal with your day-to-day matters of life in context of brothers and sisters inside the church? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. This is Jesus speaking. And he says these words to his initially apostles, but we'll see a little bit later how it extends beyond just the 12 apostles. Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in this regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Pastor John MacArthur commenting on this passage in 1 Corinthians and also this passage in Matthew says this, quote, when Jesus Christ returns to set up his millennial kingdom here on earth, believers from throughout all of history will be co-reigning with him on thrones as well. Part of our responsibility as rulers with Christ will be to judge the world. The apostles will have special authority, ruling from 12 thrones over the 12 tribes of Israel that we just read about. But every believer, every Christian, will also participate in some way. Revelation 2.26 says, He who overcomes and who keeps my deeds unto the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. Now, it's not clear in context here as we get to this next verse what exactly that judgment is going to involve. Verse 3 says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? 
how much more the things of this life. We don't know specifically what angels will be charged with judging. There are unholy angels, we would call them demons. Some are so vile, so nasty, so sinful that God has kept them in pits of darkness reserved for a time of judgment. It's possible, though we don't know specifically, but it is possible some Bible scholars would see the Christians as the ones judging those vile, despicable demons that are reserved in gloomy pits. So we don't know, and it's impossible for us to say from Scripture because it's not clear. All we can base it on is what Paul has said here, is one day we will be charged with judging angels. How cool is that? I mean, think about that for a moment. A lot of us would love to have an encounter with an angel, and someday we'll be granted the authority and responsibility to make judgments over angels. This demonstrates for us the church's ability to make decisions about conflict. As you're aware, Paul just told the church at Corinth that we will judge, and we're going to judge not only angels, but the world. We just read that Matthew will sit on his, excuse me, Jesus is going to sit on the throne and the 12 apostles ruling and judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. And each of us will be given responsibility as well for judging. Verse 4, therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned by the church? It's apparent the church in Corinth had disputes or conflicts, and they needed to resolve them. But Paul says we should never look to outsiders outside of the church to resolve our conflicts. Turn turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus gives us the prescription here of how we are to resolve conflicts inside the church. Matthew chapter 5. Beginning in verse 38. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you have heard that? You've heard it said, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. But, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. This is the conflict resolution procedure that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. For many of us, it's not what we're looking for. What if the person hurts you? What if they defame your character? What if they say things about you that aren't true? What if they write something that's published either online or in a newspaper or somewhere else for people to read and see? Surely Jesus didn't mean that we should overlook those, did he? What if somebody asks you for money and they're in need? What does verse 42 say? About that, Paul says in verse 5, I say this to shame you. He's using sarcasm here to illustrate his point. It's possible that there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers. Paul writes here that he's speaking to get their attention, to shame them, to make them feel some guilt about that. He's asking if there isn't among them a capable person who can mediate the disputes that they have. The Corinthians were very proud people. They were full of intellectuals, people who thought they were the geniuses of the day. And Paul's sort of appealing to them, well, you're all so smart. Why can't you figure this out amongst yourselves? Paul's reasoning wasn't just merely to shame them, but to spur them on to action as ones living under the Holy Spirit who lives in them. 
Verse 6, instead, one brother takes another brother to court, and this in front of the unbelievers. Paul's emphasis here is not just the point of you're suing one another in courts, it's that it's affecting your witness to the unbelievers around you. One brother takes another brother before unbelievers, and that's the appalling point to the Apostle Paul. Paul's vision, his mission, his calling from God was to take the gospel to people who had not heard it, who had not believed in Jesus Christ. And it hurts him to see that this church who he planted spent 18 months with building and shepherding and encouraging and spreading the gospel throughout the city. Now their witness in the community is tarnished because they're not They're not keeping a consistent example inside of the church. In other words, their actions inside the church don't line up with their behaviors outside the church. Secular courts cannot reflect true godly wisdom. They can't execute God's perfect justice. Justice is not blind because it treats all equally. It is blind. Here's the key because it can't see the real truth. What's truth? Remember what Jesus said? I am the way and the truth and the life. Only Jesus is the truth. And so when we go before a secular court, we're missing out on the opportunity to have Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, presiding over the conflict. Verse seven, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Paul asks, why not rather be wronged or cheated than to defame their witness within the unbelieving community around them? The objective in any lawsuit is to win, and usually it's to win money. Now, everyone will often say it's not about the money, But that's usually a dead giveaway that it is about the money, right? As a Christian, you cannot win. If you're suing somebody, you've already lost. Your witness and the reputation of the church is irrevocably damaged. James 2.8 says, love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5.13 says, by love we are to serve one another. Verse 8, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Paul pointed out that by litigating, they were already cheating, and that they were already doing so against their own brothers. By having lawsuits against one another, Paul tells them that they're already defeated. Now, let's go back to the illustration that we started with at the beginning, the pading, 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 pading of a car when we're trying to describe a problem with our vehicle. The lawsuit is like the squeaky wheel. It's a sure sign of a much bigger problem of an underlying issue. The church at Corinth has a very poor grasp of the gospel, is obvious, And they're struggling to live their lives in true reflection of Christianity. And Paul's trying to point out to them, it's like taking your car to the mechanic with that little squeak. But if it's not addressed, it's going to turn into a major problem that's going to leave the car stranded by the side of the road. And his message here is the same for the church. If they don't deal with this problem of the conflict inside the church, pretty soon it's going to grow out of control. Church is going to do more than lose its witness. It's going to fracture apart because of the disputes among them. Hopefully, therefore, from these eight verses, you see suing one another as Christians is not the right way to resolve a dispute. So if that's not the right way, then how do we do it? And fortunately, God gives us an outline of how we're to do that. Now, I want to give credit where credit is due. These next couple of slides largely come from this book, The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. It is a book that has meant so much uh, to me in ministry when families call me and ask me to try and help work through a dispute in a family or disagreement. I pull out this book all the time when couples are having trouble in their marriage and dealing with conflict. I pull out this book and refer to the principles underneath this. 
So the next couple of slides largely come from the material in Ken Sandy's book. For those of you that have been at St. Peter's for a while, we did this as a church-wide study about 10 years ago where our whole church went through the book and read it and looked at the underlying principles in it. If you've noticed, every so often I try and bring some of those principles back out because they're godly, they're biblical, they're right directly out of scriptures. So Paul tells us we can't sue one another as Christians, so how do we resolve conflicts? Number one, some conflicts are so minor that they should just be overlooked. Proverbs 19 says, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or overlook an offense. So here's the thing. Sometimes as Christians, we either intentionally or unintentionally hurt one another. And it could just be a small matter, a word that was spoken without much thought. It could be a, a overlooking an invitation to something that was important that you didn't get, whatever that might be. And Solomon says in Proverbs, it's a glory to overlook an offense. God would say to us, just let that go. Just forgive the person. You don't even need to go talk to them. Just forgive it. Overlook it. Let it go. Because in the grand scheme of things, keep in mind, one day we're going to sit on thrones judging angels. And in the grand scheme of things, a minor conflict is meaningless. And some of us have learned that lesson the hard way because we've faced major life challenges and then we look back at how we've handled some of the little things in life and we're humbled by it and say, why did I make such a big deal of that? And that's Solomon's point here in Proverbs. Some issues between brothers and sisters are so small, just let them go. Now, that's not an excuse to sweep stuff under the rug all the time. There are people that do that. Confession, that used to be my conflict management strategy. I just swept stuff under the rug. I didn't want to deal with it, whether it was with my wife or coworkers or people inside the church. I didn't want to deal with it, so I just bury it. That's different from overlooking an offense. Overlooking an offense is just granting forgiveness and moving on from there. But there are some things that are important that the conflict has to be dealt with because it's a, it's a continual headbutting between you and the other person. And if that's the case, then we go to step two, which we seek reconciliation. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, If you're presenting your offerings at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So here, God gives us the prescription for reconciliation. If we have a disagreement, a dispute, a conflict, we go to the person one-on-one -on -one as the first step of reconciliation. And keep in mind here, and we'll look at the, the next scripture in a second, if you're aware that you've hurt somebody Jesus puts the responsibility on you. It's not just the offended person. We'll look at the offended person in a moment. But if you're aware that you've said something or done something or failed to do something that hurt someone, it's on us to go and seek reconciliation from the person whom we know we've hurt or offended. It's up to us to seek reconciliation. Well, what happens if you do that? What happens if you try and sit down with that brother or sister and talk through the problem? And even after five minutes or five hours together, you're still butting heads. What do you do next? You don't just leave that conflict unresolved. You don't sweep it under the rug. You don't let it fester. The third step Jesus teaches us in Matthew 18 is to seek mediation. Jesus says this, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. Now, here's the mediation part. If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And so there are times when there's a conflict and we need somebody to help us. Maybe it's an issue in your marriage and you just hit that roadblock where you can't go any further. Ask for help. There's plenty of guidance and wisdom available to help through that. Our elders, Jerry and I, would love to help through any conflict. Not that we love conflict, but we want to see conflict resolved. Does that make sense? 
And so God often puts us as leaders in those places to help work it out. We're brothers and sisters. Again, that's the whole point of this text. Our witness outside the church starts with our witness inside the church to each other. So if you've got a problem with somebody and the two of you can't work it out, humble yourself and ask for somebody else to help you to step in, to be that mediator, that person who can help resolve the conflict. Here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So church, our job, Jesus calls us to resolve conflicts between us quickly, to make peace, to make peace. That that word peace goes all the way back to the Hebrew concept of shalom, that wellness, that sense of goodness being, not only with myself, but with others around me and with God, to help that come to be, to help peace so that the conflict stops. And so it's not headbutting anymore, but it's close together in intimacy the way God designed brothers and sisters to be in relationship with one another. Hopefully you know the answer to the question, should we sue one another? Never. We want to be peacemakers, and we want to practice biblical peacemaking of overlooking minor offenses, going to the person one-on-one when we know we've hurt them or we've been hurt by them, and when that's not successful, bringing a mediator in to help work through the conflict together so that we can quickly resolve the conflict and move on in our relationship and glorifying God. So friends, if you've got some conflicts with somebody in this room, another believer outside that's in this room, whoever that might be, seek to practice the biblical peacemaking. And if you need a mediator, please talk to Jerry or one of the elders or myself. Be glad to step in and be the mediator for you. Let's pray. The church at Corinth was so mixed up. They didn't have a full grasp of the gospel, and they were taking advantage of each other as brothers and sisters, and or we can only imagine how that breaks your heart. Lord, help us to not be like the church at Corinth from that perspective. Conflict is inevitable, Lord, between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between brothers and sisters in the church, between elders and sheep, between the the, the leadership and, and the members, between members, conflict is going to happen because the prince of the power of the air, Satan, just loves conflict and he loves to stir things up in the church. So God, help each one of us as individual members and part of this church to love each other enough to swallow our pride, to overlook simple minor offenses, just forgive it and, and move on. For those issues that are of major state, God, help our our hearts to be so soft that we'll have the courage to sit down with that brother or sister and talk openly and honestly about the conflict to bring resolution to it. And God, where that's not successful, Father, help us to, again, have the courage to reach out to, to a wise elder who can help take the biblical steps through resolving the conflict. God, help us as as a church to model that inside the church, that we take it with us to our workplaces, that it's an effective part of our witness. So many of us work in the marketplace where there's so many unbelievers that are looking for real solutions in our broken country right now. And so God, help us to model that as a church, to show that, to demonstrate that, that we quickly resolve our conflicts together whether that's inside the church, whether that's outside the church as believers that we take those philosophies and ideas with us that you've given directly from Scripture. And now, Lord, we pray you hear our prayers as Brother Mark comes to lift up our time of intercessory prayer. Father God, we just thank you that we can be here this morning. Thank you for the breath of life that you've given us. And Father, as we bring these concerns before you. We ask that your spirit would be with these people. We just pray that you would be with Ken and Linda. Kenny and Linda, is, uh, Kenny has a severe cold, and Linda's dealing with pneumonia. 
Pray, Father God, that you would be with Linda's daughter. She's in the hospital with some major health issues. And we pray, Father, that you would be with uh, Jody, who is having a difficult time with the loss of Dwayne. Just pray that you would uh, be with her and comfort her, Lord, in this time. We ask uh, for physical needs for uh, Ellen Healy, who is dealing with back and leg pain. We ask that you be with Donna Doherty, who is in the hospital with heart problems, Lord. And we just pray that you would be with Dave and Joyce's daughter, uh, Jennifer, who is in urgent need of a kidney. And Father, we just ask and pray that your spirit would be with these people and be with the ones who are involved with them, Lord. Help them to be able to uh, guide them and direct them, Lord, and let your spirit be amongst them, Father God. Father, we just pray and we ask that you be with us, each and every one who is here today. Help us as we leave here today, Lord. Help us. Uh, we, we first want to thank you that your spirit is here this morning and just thank you that we can come and be filled up. Hopefully we leave here overflowing, Lord, with the joy and that we can take that joy and spread it into the world. Be with us this week, Father God, each and every day. Father, you put opportunities before us to be a witness for you. Use us to glorify your kingdom, Lord, in those opportunities. Just bless us and keep us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody can stand and join us as we sing our last song, It Is Well. And if anybody needs any prayers, please feel free to come up for prayer. quakes before moved by the sound of his voice and seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and through it So let go of 
us well, Lord. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we can say it is well with our souls because of who you are, Father. We thank you that you are a loves us, who has called us to yourself, who has saved us. Father, and because of that saving grace, Lord, I pray that we can give grace to others, Lord, that you would help us to forgive and forget and to put aside the things that, Lord, just are not important. Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and the things that are important. And Father, if there is something that we have offense with each other, that you would help us to reconcile that, Father, to get rid of it. And Father, that we can love each other as you have called us to, Father. And that we can also take that love that you have given to us and share that and pour that out upon others in this world, Father. Father, we just praise you, we thank you, and we love you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming and have an awesome day.